So you finished writing your code, you debugged it, works great, you pushed it out live, and now you're experiencing performance issues. You want to know how to fix those issues? In this multi-part series of Visual Studio Toolbox, we're going to be talking all about profiling in Visual Studio. Hey everybody, welcome to Visual Studio Toolbox. I'm your host, Leslie Richardson, and today I am joined by my colleague, Sagar Shetty, who is a PM on the profiling team. Welcome, Sagar. Thanks for having me, Leslie. Glad to be here. Awesome. So uh, for those of you who don't know, I am actually a member of the Visual Studio debugging team, which is a smaller team in the larger Visual Studio diagnostics world. And that's where the profiling team comes in. So in this multi-part series, we're going to be talking all about profiling. But what exactly are we going to be talking about profiling, Sagar? Yeah, so just to kind of give an overview of the series, um, really excited for this. Um, basically, what I thought we'd do is kind of start with a high-level overview of profiling in the first few episodes, and really by the end of the series, kind of do a deep dive on all the various tools that the Visual Studio Profiler offers. Great. So to me, and I think a lot of other people, profiling is that thing you do where, you know, after you're done debugging things and you go ahead and ship your code, people start complaining to you about how your app is too slow, and then you have to quickly learn up on all those tools that maybe you didn't think twice about in Visual Studio in order to determine how to better improve your performance. But can you tell us a bit more about what profiling exactly is? Yeah, definitely. So it, it's kind of a lot, a lot like what you say, Leslie. Um, it really is kind of the next level of diagnostics past debugging. So there's definitely kind of, as we say internally, the inner loop scenario of day to day, trying to make sure that your code, first of all, just compiles and just has a similar behavior to what you'd expect, right? But really, there's that next level of diagnostics past that, which is, okay, like maybe my application does compile, but I want it to be a little bit more efficient, a little bit more performant. I want it to be a little bit faster, right? So that's really where profiling comes into play. And, and to be fair, not necessarily every, every developer focuses on this kind of diagnostics, um, but there is a certain subset that does, and we cater to those developers and make sure that they have proper and adequate tools in place in order to be able to solve those kind of challenges. Um, this is done by essentially measuring the performance of the application's data as it's run, capturing that performance data, and then going back and looking at it. And we'll talk more later about how our tools go about doing this. Um, and really, when we're talking about performance, it's not necessarily just one metric we're looking at. I mean, performance can refer to a lot of things, but at a high level, um, it could refer to kind of wall clock time, just the amount of time it, you know the application is taking to kind of run. Um, or complete certain operations, um, CPU times or CPU cycle, the amount of time you're holding up like a CPU or it's taking to process certain tasks, um, and also memory usage as well in terms of how much memory you're allocating for different objects and things like that. So there are a lot of different metrics we look at, um, and we have a lot of different tools to support those different kind of performance investigations. Cool. So when you start profiling, or if you're just curious at all about it, why else beyond just, yeah, like the basic, it, it, it improves your performance, should you care about profiling? Yeah, so I think there's quite a lot of value um, in what profiling offers on both to the customer and kind of on the business side as well. So just to kind of give some examples. So on the customer side and the user experience side, I think everyone just likes performance, like better performing applications, right? Faster performing applications. I'm sure you've been there, Leslie, where you know you take a mobile app or web app or any sort of app that's you just load it up and it's just sitting there and it's hanging and it's not yep. loading the thing forever, right? So there's certainly a lot of value to the customer in terms of making sure the application, like even if it does work eventually, it's not good enough. It actually needs to like work in a certain time period. Um, so less waiting, I think it leads to just happier customers in general. So on the UX side, there's definitely some value there. On the business side, there's also, I think, cost to consider too. So I think if you're hosting an application in the cloud and you're having to pay for VMs and stuff like that, you know, if you have certain optimizations and you design your application in such a way that maybe um, is a little bit more performant from a CPU standpoint or takes up less memory, perhaps, you know, you don't need as many VMs to support your applications. And as a result, your costs are lower. So there's definitely a lot of value there on the business side. And lastly, you know, we're kind of living in a world now where you're having to design software for various design uh, constraint scenarios. So devices, you know, we support IoT profiling. Um, and there are customers that we've worked with and done profiling extensively, such as like the HoloLens team and Xbox team. And they have um, products that are operating in 
in very uh, kind of specific and interesting environments such as VR um, and also just kind of like gaming engines that need to be performant because their customers are expecting a certain amount of performance that if they're not performant, those applications aren't necessarily as desirable to use, right? So kind of thinking about some of those constrained scenarios, um, profiling is definitely at the forefront of, of a lot of different people's minds, yeah. Awesome, particularly the cost uh, point came out, <laughs> stood out to me the most. Like who doesn't like things to be cheaper, especially when it comes to developing large scale applications and things absolutely. like that, right? Abs yeah, absolutely. Awesome. So as a PM on the profiling team, what kinds of customers do you typically see using the profiling tools that you create and or what kind of customer base would you like to see using it more frequently? <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. So um, at a high level, right, it's kind of going back to performance. So the, the general motivation is anyone who wants to make their application faster um, or more performant is the is kind of the the impetus or like the the initial reason why you kind of come to our tools. And I will just say that like if you haven't used our profiling tools before, definitely would recommend checking it out. There's a chance that you might get some pretty easy quick wins um, and really make your application a little bit more performant. Uh, but more than that, you know, it's generally people that are investigating issues that don't necessarily break your program in terms of preventing it from compile, but it's just too slow or maybe you're mismanaging memory and you're out of kind of memory to allocate for, for other things. Um, to be a little bit more specific than that in terms of talking about some like the industries and markets we operate in, uh, kind of alluded to it before, but like game developers, um, are really big into profiling because performance is so key to their product. Um, another kind of internal customer we work close with is is a company that builds a 3D rendering software. Um, and that that's like a very graphically intensive tool. So they they kind of heavily use our products because performance is is key to them as well. Great. I know for me, anytime I see a memory related issue when I code, it's like the worst thing you can possibly get because I mean, where do you even start? <laughs> but it's, yeah. yeah, and it seems like that goes under the larger just general performance issue umbrella. So when talking about performance, what are some other things that can count as performance issues? Because we always talk about performance like it's just this one singular thing when it's actually pretty big. Yeah, that's a great point. And, and I would say that generally speaking, there's a lot of different, to your point, performance issues that can come up. But generally speaking, they kind of fall into a few different buckets. So I'll kind of go over some of the common buckets that pop up a lot. So for one, I would say kind of mishandling CPU time. So this kind of comes back to um, just using bad or maybe slightly not modern practices in code. Um, so one thing I know you're very familiar with, with, Leslie, is like asynchronous code, right? And using yep. that pattern. Yeah. Yeah. So um, definitely, you know, if you're not necessarily using asynchronous patterns or patterns where you're using nested loops and having to constantly iterate multiple times over large data sets, um, that's going to slow down your CPU um, and really make your application less performant. Furthermore, things like not caching properly. So maybe you're making an API call to some sort of external data frame or data set and loading up like a large data set. Um, and if you don't cache that properly and every time you make that API call, you need to reload that large data set, that's also going to slow um, your application down. Um, another thing kind of under CPU time is kind of string, string building and logging code. So this is kind of like um, a, a bit of a debugging diagnostics thing. But as you're kind of building out those strings, that operation is really expensive. And that cost is distributed across your whole application. So that can really slow down the entire application. So all of those kind of bad patterns, not using asynchronous code, not caching properly, are kind of examples of, of different patterns that may uh, show up under mishandling CPU time. Uh, to your point about mishandling memory and that being tough to solve, that's definitely another high level issue we see a lot. So that kind of comes down to maybe allocating too much memory or too often um, or not deallocating memory once you've kind of like had your fill with a specific object and hanging, hanging on to objects well past their lifetime. Um, this kind of leads to not garbage collecting properly. And, and luckily, you know, if you're operating within some managed memory languages like um, like C Sharp, for example, and using the .NET framework, um, there is like the system, the runtime does kind of take care of some garbage collection for you. So it's definitely getting better at the runtime level with that. Um, but we do have tools that help you visualize um, kind of issues with your memory allocation, which is tough to do um, otherwise without the tools. And also we have tools that can help force garbage collection because even though the runtime does a decent job of kind of collecting on its own, sometimes, and we'll talk about these scenarios in future videos where you may want to force that garbage collection, um, we have tools that are able to help you do that. And so kind of, so we talked about mishandling CPU time, we talked about mishandling memory. The, the last kind of major bucket I'll talk about is kind of external dependencies of your app. Um, so obviously you kind of have, you have your user code, um, but if you're kind of making API calls over different networks or slow database calls, or you have those external dependencies, right? 
it's a bit tricky to kind of figure out maybe what's going wrong because you don't necessarily have access to all of those um, external different bits you're playing around with. So we have tools for that as well um, that can help you kind of deal with those scenarios. All right, cool. So at this point, you've figured out that you're having performance issues in your code. It could be a memory issue, a CPU issue, or external dependencies that are just too slow to respond. Now what? Like for most people who don't know these tools, chances are they probably got to play the trial and error game with this, right? So how can we be taking more advantage of the existing tools in Visual Studio to fix those issues? Definitely. So we talked a little bit about like what profiling is and kind of the common scenarios like you suggested. And so now um, kind of wanted to end this video kind of with a little teaser into what's to come and kind of getting started. So I'm going to launch Visual Studio and share my screen real quick. Okay, so now we're in Visual Studio, and basically, you know, I want to kind of answer the question: How do I get started and start using some of the Visual Studio profiling tools? So, to kind of to mock this up, I have an ASP.NET Core web application loaded up, and to kind of get started with some of the profiling tools, what I'll first introduce is the Performance Profiler. So, uh, what is it, and how do I get there? So, to get to the Performance Profiler, there's a few different ways, but you can go to Debug and then click on the Performance Profiler in the context menu. There's also this keyboard shortcut Alt F2. Um, I'll just click on this button here. And now we get to this particular summary page. So essentially, uh, at a high level, and we'll go into the performance profiler more in depth in future videos, but basically, it's a suite of tools that allows you to drive your performance investigations and look at a lot of different kinds of metrics. So we have like the CPU usage tool to do different CPU investigations. We have a few different memory tools. We've got a new async tool to kind of see you know, where your application is spending a lot of time with certain tasks. Uh, and today, I'll kind of just kind of showcase the CPU usage tool and highlight just the basic collection process, uh, because this is one of our most used tools. Um, we'll talk about this more in a future video, but you can use a few of these tools in conjunction. There's also a bunch with in terms of optimizing different profiling settings. Uh, but for now, I'll just kind of keep the defaults on. This and is interesting. So, it's like it's it's like uh, the profiler has its own little world. Yeah, yeah. On menu screen and everything. Yeah, it's got a lot of different tools, and it's creating this diag session, as you can see here. And one cool thing about this is, like, once you're done and you collect a bunch of data, you can send it to a colleague, and they can kind of load it up on their machine and kind of help you with that investigation by kind of seeing what what happened on your machine too. So you kind of have a little bit of that collaboration there. Um, so um, once you kind of have the CPU usage tool clicked, you can hit start to kind of start the process. In the interest of time, now I've kind of already done the collection, but you'll hit start and kind of let it run for a few seconds. Um, and then there's a stop collection button. But at the end, what you'll get is kind of an output of this kind of a report. So this is our CPU usage tool. And again, we'll have a whole dedicated video to this. But basically, um, with most of our tools, we kind of have this swim lane up top, which has kind of a graph to show some basic data points over time generally. And then we have some sort of tabular view. And it really depends on the tool, like what that table is showing. But basically here, uh, we have some functions that are of interest and are kind of taking up a lot of the CPU and some hot paths, which are essentially some, some areas of code that you should really go back and dig into that um, are also, in this case, taking up a, a lot of the, the CPU's resources. You know, so, there's nothing more astute looking than having graphs in your presentation. Yeah, and you got to <laughs> like love that, the pie chart, right? Right? Like, uh, when I have to make presentations sometimes, I always get really excited when I'm able to include a graph. It's like, oh, man, much more official now. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. And so, yeah, that's kind of basically a summary of the performance profiler. Again, we'll totally go into a more in-depth um, overview of this in the future. But if for anyone that's for the enthusiastic learners amongst us, if you really want to kind of dig in, get started, kind of go to the performance profiler, go to Alt F2, and then kind of play around with the tools. That's great. So from my experience, I am familiar with in the Diagnostics Hub window, it also has a CPU usage tool. What's the difference between the two? Yeah, so in our very next episode, we're going to kind of unpack that a lot more. But basically, uh, with that one, one of the advantages with that window is it allows you to take advantage of all of our great uh, debugger features that you're well aware of, Leslie, yeah. having worked on that. Um, and so it's really cool to kind of get that interaction between some of the profiling tools that we have as well as the debugger. So the diagnostics tool window is really kind of using those two in conjunction. Um, the performance profiler is more kind of like these standalone tools. Um, a little bit more robust, and you also get a few different visualizations because we just have some tools in the performance profiler that don't necessarily have an equivalent counterpart in the diagnostics tool window. Um, and we'll talk about some of those more niche tools later on, but yeah. So on the larger scale, before we do deep dives on each different really awesome feature in the later parts, what would you say are like some of the hardest challenges when it comes to developing for the profiling space? 
Oh, wow. That's a really good question. Uh, so I would say kind of at a high level, there's two main challenges. So one is that we collect tons and tons of data. And so something we really want to do for our customers is make sure that that data is very digestible and easy to visualize and actionable. So kind of figuring out how we want to best visualize the large amounts of data sets that we deal with is, I think, a bit tricky. And the second thing kind of along those lines is, is tying that data back to the code and essentially figuring out like how can you connect because like, we have tons of data that's spit out. And um, again, we want to make sure it's actionable. So kind of being able to highlight the specific parts of, of your code that are of interest and are the areas that you need to focus on um, to fix your problem is ultimately another big challenge. That makes total sense. I can only imagine having to try to sift through a giant list of information and being unable to quickly locate the actual hot point. Yeah, that's a lot of yeah. <laughs> Great. So that um, do you have any final thoughts before we dive into all these really cool tools and later parts? Yeah, again, just really excited to start the series. In the next episode, we're going to go over the performance profile a little bit more in depth, kind of talk about more of the tools, because again, we just kind of briefly talked about the CPU usage tool today. Mm -hmm. um, we'll also be doing a little bit of an overview on kind of optimizing settings, kind of going over scenarios where you can start to use a few of the tools in tandem, and then also hopefully mentioning the diagnostic tool window um, that you brought up, Leslie, the one that it's more integrated with the debugger. So again, kind, kind of going back to the idea of like, how can we best use a few of these tools in conjunction and not just focusing just kind of on one tool. So yeah. Fantastic. Well, thanks for joining me, Sagar. And I look forward to uh, having you join us for future episodes to come. Thanks for having me. Had a good time. Great. See y'all later.